Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the finals of the FDT Canadian Public Speaking Contest. We are so excited to welcome our six grand finalists, our celebrity VIP judges, and everyone watching from across the country and maybe even around the world because we are live on Facebook. Um, so hopefully some people are tuning in uh, because we have some excellent performances, excellent speeches prepared for this evening. Uh, my name is Frankie Chenna. I am the host of this contest and the founding director of FDT Academy and um, welcome again to the finals. So uh, FDT decided to run this contest for a variety of reasons. First of all, we wanted to put a positive spin on COVID-19. We understand this is a very difficult time for people across the country and around the world. And uh, therefore, we wanted to really try to find the light at the end of the tunnel of COVID-19 by giving young Canadians the opportunity to speak about this topic in a somewhat positive way, talking about the heroes of COVID-19 and talking about the future life after COVID-19. We also wanted to give young Canadians something to do. And thankfully, we gave 190 students across the country something to do as they prepared and delivered video presentations for our preliminary judges. And a huge thank you to all 20 of them who um, marked and provided feedback on every single speech that was delivered and sent uh, to FDT. But next, we also wanted to hopefully provide an incentive and some financial gain for some of the students. And the six students here are competing for over $10,000 in scholarships tonight. Thankfully, everyone's going to be going home a winner because at this stage of the competition, everyone is getting something. So congratulations. There is a lot at stake here. No pressure. Um, but some people are, or everyone's going home with something. Um, and we're very, very excited for that. And finally, we wanted to do our part to help our community. And that's why we felt it was very obvious to partner with Food Banks Canada in uh, donating to them $5 for every uh, speech that we received. So we'll be rounding that up to $1,000. We also have have another group that was inspired uh, by our donation who's going to be speaking later tonight. They have a presentation as well that they want to be giving something to Food Banks Canada. Um, so all in all, we wanted to do something positive for our community as well. Um, and that is why we partnered with Food Banks Canada. So the structure of tonight is very straightforward. We're going to start with our three finalists in the grade four to seven category, then move on to our three finalists in the grade eight to 12 category. We're going to then give some time for our judges to rank those students one, two, and three. And then we are going to announce the winner of the FDT public speaking contest. But before that, we have to introduce our panel of judges. Uh, our first judge is Amira Devera. And Amira is actually the publicist of this competition. She has been helping get the word out um, for all of our um, media partnerships and getting us interviews to really spread the word. And uh, she's the owner of Public for Relations. So thank you so much, Amira, for being with us. Next, we have Olivia Railton. Olivia is the World Speech Champion of 2017. She now attends Oxford studying law. Um, and I've had the pleasure of watching her speak. And I know that she is immensely qualified to be assessing um, our six grand finalists tonight. Next, we have the CEO of Food Banks Canada. Obviously, we are giving a lot uh, to uh, this organization as they have given so much to uh, Canadians. So thank you so much to have the CEO, Chris Hatch, with us um, as well. And he'll be speaking a little bit later about Food Banks Canada. Next, we have Vanessa Ponce de Leon. Vanessa is a dear friend of mine, um, but she is most known for being Miss World 2018. And I had the pleasure of meeting her both in Mexico and at the Miss World uh, finals that, where she took the title um, and has been a professional volunteer and doing um, ambassadorial work ever since then and ever since winning her crown. So thank you so much, Vanessa, for being with us. And I, uh, as the owner of the, the company, the host of the competition, um, I will be judging Finally, I get to, to watch and assess these speeches myself, um, and I'll be your fifth judge for this evening. So without further ado, we're going to start with our first contestant in the junior category. He comes from Ontario. This is Jin Zhou. Christmas is a season of giving. It is a season of laughter, merriment, and cold nights with warm conversations and friends. 
Little did I know that this season will be the calm before the storm. I am a Christmas tree. Ten years ago, a doctor planted me in the hospital screen space in New York City. For many Christmases, I represented the joy of the season, but the Christmas of 2019 was different. It was my doctor's last day working at the hospital before his retirement. After 40 years of helping people through the most difficult times of their lives, he was leaving. As a Christmas tree, I observe all that goes on in the hospital. People come in and out, and occasionally an ambulance drop by. This is my life, until one day, everything changed. The street was empty. All was eerily silent. I heard people talking about a virus from Wuhan, China, that was reaching out its infectious claws to thousands more each day. At the hospital in which I lived, doctors and nurses began to wear masks more often. Then they started to wear protective gear and distance themselves from one another. More and more patients flooded in. Soon, lives were lost to the disease. Doctors stifled their sobs as they chose who got to live and who got to die. Nurses coughed in their masks and joined their patients in isolation areas. Ventilators were scarce, yet they were constantly. Patients lined the hallways as doctors scrambled into room after room. The dead families were given two hours to take the body out. And soon after that, the still warm beds were rapidly filled with new patients. The government called for help from more medical professionals, and to my surprise, my doctor came back. Although he was quite old and frail, he joined the war against this virus. For weeks on end, my doctor was sealed inside the hospital, treating patient after patient. At the end of each extended shift, he would sigh and rest for some time sitting beneath my bow. On many days, I observed him as he left to go into his car, but his car never left the parking lot. He would sleep in his car at night, shadowed by the fear that he could spread the virus to his family. Then, for the first time in an entire month, I haven't seen my doctor for a week. I am terrified for him. I can imagine him coughing in his mask, wheezing. I can imagine him hooked onto a ventilator, kept alive by a tube down his throat. I can imagine his wispy gray hair peeking from beneath the white sheets. I can imagine his body being carted out of this hospital, his second home for the majority of his life, in a body bag. Nurses and doctors are selflessly fighting through their fears and fatigue in the face of this pandemic. As a Christmas tree, I saw the ups and downs of life. But at the end, the lights on my tree will always shine. May your homes be filled with joy next Christmas. When this darkness is over, I will remember their sacrifices for as long as I lived. The doctors, nurses, and all essential workers who fought to the end to give us a better world must be remembered for their courage and determination. They are the heroes of COVID-19. Thank you very much, Jin. Our second speaker is also from Ontario, and it is Millie Steinman. I call my granddad every week. 
He lives in the UK and he's a doctor. Last week, he sent me a photo of the protective mask he has to wear when he treats COVID-19 patients. The mask covers his whole face with a clear visor over his eyes and dark black plastic over the bottom half of his face, making him look rectangular and robotic. We joke that he only needs to add a lightsaber and he would tune into Darth Vader. But then we are quiet as we remember the reason why he has to wear it. I ask my granddad what it feels like to be a hero. He shakes his head and laughs at the thought. I ask him who he thinks the real heroes of COVID-19 are. He pauses. We all are, he says with a somber smile. I think about this for a moment. What does it mean to be a hero anyway? I realize that not every hero stars in a comic, but I do believe that every hero displays courage, makes personal sacrifices, and perseveres through adversity. Am I a hero for staying at home? Is it true that anyone who is fighting this disease, whether it is as a patient, in looking after patients, in trying to find a vaccine in laboratories, in making difficult government decisions, in stocking shelves, in groceries, in pharmacies, are all heroes in different ways. Everyone has a personal story, maybe a personal joy or a personal tragedy. Hi, my name is Millie Steinman, and today I'd like to talk to you about some of the heroes of COVID-19. It doesn't take long to find many heroes of people doing heroic things online. Take Dr. Li Wenyang as an example a Chinese ophthalmologist in Wuhan, who was one of the first doctors to warn people about a possible virus outbreak. Sadly, he died of COVID-19 on February 7th. Like Elena Pagliarini, an Italian nurse whose photo slumped over her desk, head on hands, eyes shut beneath the protective equipment, with sheer exhaustion, is a stark reminder of how much health workers are sacrificing. Like Keith Saunders, a manager at a great Canadian superstore in Ontario. Tragically, he died of coronavirus at age 48. His wife called him a gentle giant. He spent the weeks before his death dealing with panic buying customers who were emptying the shelves quicker than he could fill them. Like Ashley Lawrence, a university student in Kentucky who has invented a mask with a see-through front so that people who are hard of hearing can lip read even when someone is wearing the mask like Emma Bethgall from Ireland, who posted a heartbreaking photo of her father meeting his new grandson through a window. The grandfather's face full of joy and sadness as he met his new grandson, but couldn't go near him. Like Captain Tom in the UK, an 100-year-old army veteran who has raised over 30 million pounds for the National Health Service through sponsored walks through his garden, the British are petitioning to knight him. And like Charlie Papereau from Hamilton, Ontario, whose four-year-old body is filled with cancer and only has weeks to live. Since his parents are not going to be able to give him a big funeral, they have organized a parade full of family and friends to drive past their house with banners and balloons to say goodbye. We have all been taught about the greatest generation, the heroes who have fought against the Nazis in the Second World War. Well, this is a type of war too, except this time the enemy is the virus. The front lines are the hospitals and clinics, and the people behind the front lines are those supplying the needs, such as grocery and pharmacy workers and truck drivers. And then there's everyone else who are just playing their part. Today, thousands of people are volunteering their time to pack food and supplies to families in need and the elderly, sewing masks for health workers, giving gifts to UPS delivery men, or just staying at home to stop the spread of the virus. My granddad was right, we're all heroes. If there is something we can learn from this terrible pandemic, it is that everyone has the capacity to be heroic. Whether that's keeping social distance, being kind and resilient, staying positive and resilient, and being kind and generous. And then maybe, just maybe, all of our sacrifices will be worthwhile. Thank you. Thank you very much, Millie. And it's time for our final junior contestant, also from Ontario, Pratika Lahiri. Bravery is the capacity to perform properly. 
even when scared, half to death. A quote said by Omar Bradley. So imagine this, you're a frontline worker working in such horrifying conditions, meeting with people who may or may not be infected by COVID. And then a few days later, where do you end up? Probably in the ICU or on the verge of death. You wouldn't want that to be you, the parents you cherish dearly, your friends or even your relatives, would you now? Well, sadly, but most importantly, thankfully, there are amazing people out there who are taking such risks to ensure that we are safe. From taking measures such as staying up all night, finding ways to cure this pandemic, to working hours and hours on their shifts, till they get marks on their faces from their masks, we couldn't thank you enough. Hello, my name is Pratik Lahiri, and today I'll be talking to you about the heroes of COVID-19. So let me tell you a story of Dr. Michael, who is an emergency physician in Calgary, Canada. So recently, he and his wife got a new baby girl. How happy, right? Well, not in this case, since he has a very high risk of getting infected due to his workspace area. He had no choice but to move away to an empty condo rented from one of his friends. You can probably imagine how this doctor is feeling right now guilt, and even anguish because he can't be with his newborn baby girl during her first months of her life. Dr. Michael is working endlessly, days and days in a row, finding ways to treat his patients and cure this pandemic. Truly a hero. And there are so many people like Dr. Michael who are making these sacrifices. Not only doctors, but a very underappreciated healthcare service is being a personal support worker or even a nurse. Let's take personal support workers, for example. Places like where they work are very prone to this disease since they work in old age homes and old people tend to be more vulnerable to this illness. This takes a lot of guts and taking the initiative to do this job is very audacious. Even many nurses have to experience working in such disease prone areas. Sadly, many nurses have even passed away due to this virus. Going as far as risking your life so you can save someone is a huge heroic act. So we do thank doctors, nurses, and personal support workers, but we can't forget those who also play an important role. Just a list a few. This includes scientists who are finding vaccines for this pandemic, retail workers, and basically all frontline workers. So I've talked about these frontline workers, but what about us? Can we be heroes? Of course we can. To help these amazing people, we should also do our job of making sure we stay home and social distance. It's already hard for these frontline workers and we don't wanna make it even harder for them because after all, we might be the ones who suffer in the long run. It is also our responsibility to follow the guidelines that the local and federal government call out from time to time as the situation changes. So at times like this, we truly understand the importance of these healthcare heroes and how we should never ever take their services for granted. These people have to experience working in such horrible conditions, such as lack of personal protective equipment like masks, to understaffed hospitals. The fact that they still continue to work, despite all these horrible things, is so courageous, and we should realize that. Not all heroes wear a cape, and I give my kudos to these unsung heroes. Thank you. There you have it, our three grade four to seven grand finalists. Congratulations to the three of you and please await your results as we now begin the grade eight to 12 finalists. And our first grade eight to 12 finalist comes from British Columbia, Ashley Wong. Uh, can everyone hear me? One day, she will ask you, Mom, what did the world look like 
when you came out of quarantine, did the world change? Did the world look different? What were you scared of? And I will tell her that the COVID did not discriminate between race, class, gender, or sexuality. That only we did. We did it in Singapore, where thousands of workers were forced to live in cramped concrete rooms. We did it in America, where overcrowded prisons led to the disease running rampant through prison cells. We did it in Indian slums, where isolation led to starvation. And I will tell her that the pandemic shed light on all of these wrongs. But when the world woke up from quarantine, we were so quick to turn the lights back off. And she will ask, why else were you scared? And I will say, because when the world woke up from quarantine, I was scared of discrimination. Hearing another person roll down their window and tell me to get out of Vancouver and go back to filthy China. Reading even more graffiti that said, drive them out of Canada. I was scared that they would write in your history books, COVID-19, the China virus. I was scared of racial abuse. And then the economy collapsed. People struggled to pay their bills. Landlords evicted tenants. Governments were in debt. Small businesses failed to reopen. And I was scared that it would look like this forever, that the world would stay the same. And she will ask me, did it? And I will tell her, no. Life after quarantine did not look like this forever. Because just as we were about to get onto that same constant wheel of life, we realized that Quarantine had been a gift, a gift of introspection, a gift of perspective, a gift of reflection. But we knew that we did not want to throw this gift away. And we realized just in time that we needed to make a change. So we made changes to our environment. I tell her how we learned from eight weeks in quarantine and slowed our global warming by reducing our carbon emissions. I tell her how we maintained lower pollution levels, inspired by how much our waste dropped during quarantine. I tell her how we established protected safe zones for animals, because quarantine made us realize that sometimes we were the virus. And then I tell her about people, about the exchange of doctors from countries all around the world about the thousands of free hotel rooms offered to healthcare workers and doctors, about the hundreds of people who volunteered for vaccination trials, about the massive increase in donations to food banks and blood banks and charities, about kindness, about humanity, and how that kindness stayed as the world woke up from quarantine. And I will tell her that when the world woke up from quarantine, it was tough. It was different. And I wish that someone had been able to tell me that even though it was hard, even though it was terrifying, eventually it would all get better. Because sometimes the only thing that we can count on is the kindness of other people. That COVID was horrible and tragic, but it also brought people and countries and the world together like never before. That we are all human and we are all in this together. She will ask me, so mom, everything got better then? And I will look at her and I will smile and I will say, yes, thank you. Thank you to our first grade eight to 12 finalist. Next up, we have Rafiq.
the world after quarantine will never be the same, we lament. Hell yeah. Hair will need combing, makeup will be pulled into action, deodorant will have to come out of retirement. Matching socks, iron shirts, breath mints. I'm going to have to wear pants to school. Jokes aside, our world's future will depend on the choices we make. We have the chance, individually and collectively, to hit the reset button. Opportunity follows calamity. While humans have been forced to stop, the Earth has been allowed to breathe. The WHO estimates that pollution kills 4.2 million people annually. According to NASA, levels of nitrogen dioxide, a byproduct of burning fossil fuels, has decreased by 30% in China since the pandemic. Researchers say this has likely saved 75,000 lives. In New York, carbon monoxide emissions have decreased by 50%. In Istanbul, air pollution has dropped 35%. Dolphins have returned to the canals of Venice, and the sky in New Delhi has been revealed. Whether this is a springboard for environmental rejuvenation depends not on coronavirus, but on us. Do we choose carpooling? Do we choose carpooling and electric cars? Do we take meetings virtually and choose to fly less? Do we choose to buy from manufacturers who use renewable energy? We have choices to make. Reevaluating our individual and national priorities will be essential for a healthier world. In 2018, the world spent $1.8 trillion on military expenditure. Yet today, Nations are scrambling to find 75 cent masks. We possess enough missiles to destroy the world, but we don't have enough ventilators to keep our people alive. According to the WHO, 3.8 billion people lack basic health care, and 750 million don't have clean water to wash their hands. Viruses don't need passports to cross borders. The pandemic has demonstrated that if one of us gets sick, all of us are at risk. We need to ask ourselves, what's truly important? Do we choose leaders who build walls and buy weapons, or those who invest in disaster planning, education, health? Do we choose to spend $100 on a third pair of sneakers, or do we donate it to UNICEF? We have choices to make. Before COVID, we spent life staring at our phones, oblivious to all that was around us. Now, all we have is our phones, and we realize that it's not enough. We are craving a different kind of FaceTime. This pandemic has shown us how crucial our relationships with each other are. 79% of Canadians pulled by Angus Reid said that the first thing they want to do after quarantine is hug friends and family. In Italy, people in the depths of despair connected by singing together on their balconies. Our heroes are no longer inconsequential reality TV stars, but healthcare workers. We need to look at what truly matters. Do we return to our phones or do we appreciate friends sitting beside us? Do we turn to retail therapy or do we turn to each other when we need comfort? Do we get consumed by life's busyness or do we pause to appreciate the things we've taken for granted? We have choices to make. The world after quarantine will never be the same. Our world has been brought to its knees. That we will rise is not a question. The question is how we will rise. 
we have choices to make. Thank you very much, Rafiq. It's time for our final contestant of the senior category, but also our final contestant of the FTT Canadian Public Speaking Contest. He is from Alberta, Zaki Lakani. Hi there. Whether you're watching this on your couch, at your kitchen table, or secretly in your underwear, I've got a message for you. Times are changing. These past few months have forced us to confront one of the greatest global challenges in recent history. As the coronavirus pandemic continues to magnify worldwide, and as lockdowns and social distancing advisories continue to persist, it seems that our society is far removed from what it once was. But I believe it's important to remember that like previous human health crises, this too shall pass. But it begs the question, what will things look like when it does pass? It's no secret that our futures have been thrust into uncertainty. In my view, life after quarantine will bring us together, not only in terms of physical interaction, but in enduring the fallout of this crisis as a global community. The two aspects of the world post-quarantine I wish to discuss lie in two words rebuilding and reflecting. So first, let's discuss rebuilding. The coronavirus has left our civil societies and our economies decimated. The world has practically come to a standstill. And while we don't know specifically how or when public places will reopen, I am confident that quarantine will enable us as citizens and our governments alike to pivot what I mean by this is that social distancing will prepare us for a stronger re-entry into normal life. It gives us time to renew our priorities and to plan for a more advanced and adaptive future. We've heard the adage, necessity is the mother of invention. Well, in the post-COVID era, those words will never hold truer. In an increasingly technological and volatile world, we will see a surge in the culture of self-starters. Individuals who take the initiative to create solutions and recoup the losses in our daily lives that this crisis has caused. Where Netflix party and Zoom solved movie nights with friends and online learning, out of this quarantine will emerge the latest pioneers of telemedicine, mobile virus tracking, or ventilator production. From temperature scanning helmets in China to UV sanitizing robots, governments and enterprises will invest in rebuilding by creating innovative breakthroughs in technology and public health that will enable us to both reposition and future-proof ourselves. But in addition to being a period of rebuilding, life after quarantine will be a period of reflection. No longer will we take for granted physical conversations with people we can only FaceTime now, or try new restaurants with our friends, or have the time of our lives at concerts. There is solidarity in struggle. This is a global crisis that extends beyond race, borders, or religion, and that calls on us to grant assistance to those who need it most. Now, I can't promise that the hand sanitizer and face masks will be put away immediately. And we don't have a crystal ball or a vaccine just yet. But we do have hope, optimism, and Zoom. Progress is still possible after lockdown that will enable us to adjust to the new normal, even though this progress may not occur quickly and may still need to be achieved six feet away from others. But I am confident that we will feel a sense of completion again, as our parents return to work, our students return to school or university, and we salute those who have helped us overcome these truly unprecedented times. We may be in this for now, but we're not in this forever. And most importantly, we are in it together. 
We as a global community have endured turmoil and crisis in the past, and it is my hope that this crisis will be no exception. So stay healthy and stay safe, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zaki, and thank you to our six grand finalists of the FDT Canadian Public Speaking Contest. I've said that a lot of times today, but um, <laughs> that's okay. Um, probably saying it a few more times. So judges, please submit your ballots before we turn to you for your feedback and your comments uh, to the kids. And while you are doing that, I have several thank yous to go through. Um, and then I'm going to call over Kathy Chenna to speak a little bit more about FDT. We have a check presentation for Food Banks Canada. And then we're going to announce our scholarship winners first, second, third of the competition. So first of all, I want to thank all of the preliminary judges who uh, viewed and judged these submissions. Jamal, Giselle, Kathy, Jacqueline, Tanya, Dana, Sherwin, Panthea, Zakir, Bianca, and Maggie. Thank you so much for your time in that process. I also want to thank the mentors who worked with each of our finalists to help perfect their speeches and get them ready for tonight's competition. We have Lucy, Kathy, Zachary, Kieran, Nelly, Chelly, Sara, and Angelina. Thank you so much to them for all of their hard work. And thank you to our finals judges who are with us earlier today, Andrew, Alex, Ashley, and Maggie, Simran, and Lily for getting us to this point of the competition. Uh, also, of course, thank you to um, uh, Amir Devera and uh, her public relations company for um, helping us with all of the promotions of this competition. Um, and of course, to Food Banks Canada uh, for being um, our partners and allowing uh, us to donate to such a worthy, worthy cause. So I would now like to welcome uh, Kathy Chenna to speak a little bit more about the company before we get to our judges' feedback and results. There we go, great. We're a few inches apart in height. So Frankie said all the thank yous already and I'm gonna thank um, all of the students. Thank our team who's been working um, relentlessly behind the scenes. This has been a few months of a project. And yes, Project 4 Amira, thank you for all of your help across the country. It's, it's been amazing. Um, I do what you do, but people don't know me. So uh, as soon as they see you and your company, things happen. So I really appreciate that. Um, so what I wanna say is that FDT, we're a full service debate and speech academy. And and what does that mean? Well, we teach kids across the country now, now especially that we're online. And excuse me, you can check us out at fdtacademy.com. But more than that, we have group lessons, private lessons. We take kids on 40 different tournaments throughout the year and more internationally um, and also uh, throughout Canada and the US. Currently not right now, but I'd like to think of us as a pioneer when it comes to being, um, being the people that are out there with the online um, in information, if you will. Uh, we've done three, four, five different tournaments just in a week alone. Some of the kids that competed today Day. I actually just saw them this past week competing at, at national speech competitions, which, which were amazing. And essentially, essentially, that's what we're doing. We're, we're trying to take a passion that kids have and not make it stop. You know, we continue to make this grow. And because of that, we've grown our company to over 350 students now. So we're very, very proud. Um, we truly are family business, as I said earlier. Um, I do get to work with my children every day, albeit on Zoom. Today, we're a little more together in the office, so that's good. Uh, so we're just waiting for your submissions, but I asked the kids earlier to tell me something that we don't know about them. So they're gonna have to think about something else. I heard they were afraid of dogs. Some are, are, are big competitive swimmers, uh, but I wanna hear something else that's a little different now. Uh, Rafiq, why don't you go first? Rafik, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, great. Why don't you tell us first? Something interesting about myself? Yeah. Mm, yeah. I've never broken a bone. Okay, that's good. And Zachy, how about you? Um, I just reached six foot, so I'm pretty proud of that. <laughs> well, I'm four foot nine, so, but I have a six foot personality. That's what I like to say. Okay, next is, let's see, Ashley, are you there? Hi, uh, I said swimming last time, but uh, I'm really into K-pop. 
Okay, that's good to know. Jen, how about yourself? Um, I hate water. I always hate swimming. Whenever I swim, like I just, I just don't like it. You don't I like. But do you like to drink water or no? Well, I do drink water, but I hate being in water. Oh yeah, me too. I'm not a good swimmer. Yeah, when you step in water with your socks on, it's ridiculous. Yeah, actually, uh, Jin and Millie were a couple of the kids that I saw this weekend, and I wanted to jump through the computer and be like, hey, you're in our competition, but I couldn't do that, of course. How about you, Millie? What's something that we don't know about you or uh, something interesting? Uh, something that a lot of people don't know about me is my real name's Amelia, but everyone calls me Millie. So. Oh, wow. That is kind of neat. And let's see, did I miss anybody? Pratika, yeah. yes I did, Pratika, there you go. How about yourself? Um, this is um, not a really popular thing, but I like to do competitive math. I like math a lot. That's okay, <laughs> math, public speaking, you're gonna go far, just keep to the scholastics. Okay, well it seems like we probably have our winners because Frankie is next to me, so I'm gonna slide out so he can slide in, just a moment. Okay, so the judges have submitted their ballots, so we're going to now turn to them for their feedback, beginning with Miss World 2018, Vanessa Ponce de Leon. Well, hello everyone. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you, Frankie, for having me here. And I, I just want to tell everyone that you all have better public speaking skills than I will ever have. I'm surprised. I'm amazed. I, I was inspired. I, I got reflection and, and, and you also made me laugh, which is something hard to do to make you reflect, be very deep and also make you laugh. So congratulations to you all and congratulations to the FDT Academy because you're doing an amazing, amazing job with these kids. Thank you so much, Vanessa. Great to see you and great to have you as always. And next we have the publicist for the competition, Amira Devera. Hi guys, I um, just wanted to say congratulations to all of you who made it this far. I think it's amazing that out of all the kids who entered, you guys have made it to the final, so congratulations. Um, everyone did amazing. Jin, um, I wanted to say your speech gave me chills, like it was super eerie, but in like a very good way. <laughs> um, but very, very good. I mean, all of you did great. And then um, Zaki, I was ready to vote for you as our next prime minister. <laughs> so, but congratulations to everybody. Thank you so much, Amira. Next, we have the world speech champion from 2017, Olivia Railton. Oh, Olivia, please unmute. Oh. <laughs> there you go. Um, thank you all of you for those really, really wonderful speeches. I have given and heard a lot of persuasive speeches um, over the course of the last decade or so. And I can honestly say that those six were some of the best that I've heard in a really long time. Um, persuasive speech is a really wonderful niche of public speaking because it draws from so many different places and people have such unique and individual styles. And I think what was really special about all of those is that you each really spoke as yourselves, like you really made the topics your own. Some of them were humorous and some of them were you know, like Amira said, very eerie. Others were just really compelling and almost poetic. And I, I really enjoyed listening to all of them. And it was great to hear what you all had to say. And what a wonderful thing to do with your time during quarantine. And yeah, thank you to Frankie for having me as well. Thank you so much, Olivia. Thank you for joining us. And finally, our final judge is going to speak uh, about the, the contest, but also going to speak about Food Banks Canada. It's CEO, Chris Hatch. Thank you, Frankie. Thank you very much for having me here tonight. Uh, what fun. Uh, first of all, congratulations to all the finalists. Uh, I can tell you it takes a lot of guts and you need to be very brave to go before the camera. Part of my job is going before live TV and live camera and live radio. So this will prepare you well for the future business world. So uh, it takes a lot of guts to get in front of the camera. You guys were all in front of the camera. As the other judges said, I found a lot of humor. I found some very poignant uh, storytelling. And you all, I thought you all told stories, but I, I can follow your story uh, more, than, more than a pitch or a speech. It was a story. You guys are all great storytellers. I was really, really impressed with how you uh, used your hands, moved across the stage. Uh, the nonverbal spoke as loudly as the verbal. And don't, don't ever underestimate the, uh, 
the nonverbal when you when you're presenting or pitching or talking or making a business presentation. So hats off to all of you. I learned a lot. So anytime you can walk away learning something, uh, even great. And so I even learned a lot about what's going on uh, in the world and what could be going on post COVID uh, nineteen. So congratulations to all of you. Now, I, I Frankie asked me to say a few words about Food Banks Canada. Uh, for some of you who don't know, uh, I'm the CEO of Food Banks Canada. And uh, our, our job really is to support the food banking system in Canada. And uh, there are over 3,000 food banks in Canada that we support directly and indirectly. And we mainly support them by doing fundraising for them and, and supplying them with funds so they can run their operations and also with food. So we're shipping a lot of food across the country, large scale. And we're, and we're covering the entire country coast to coast to coast. Uh, we shipped food by air up to Nunavut, Akalawit last week, but we covered the entire country. So everywhere in Canada, there's a food bank. Uh, and just to give you some statistics, over the last 10 years, Food Banks Canada has shipped 1.4 billion pounds of food to the food banks across the country to help with their own food supplies, to feed people in their communities. And we have raised and shared over $70 million with food banks across the country to support the food banking system uh, our vision is a Canada where no one goes hungry. So that's a vision we keep striving for. And uh, just to wrap up with the theme that we have here tonight, Frankie. So my COVID heroes, as I've been talking about for the last two months uh, in the media, are the frontline workers, our food bankers, both staff and volunteers. They come out every day. They face tremendous risks. And they are meeting with people to help keep them fed, whether they bring food to homes, they bring food to them at the food bank, or they're sorting food. I mean, they, they are our frontline heroes in my world. There are many, many frontline heroes, but they're the frontline heroes of our world. And just to put in perspective, before the COVID hit, uh, we were seeing, so in the normal times before COVID, we were seeing 1.1 million visits to food banks every month in Canada. And so that number has only gone up and up and up. If you guys talk about post-COVID, we're currently working on what it's going to look like post-COVID as well. So again, thank you very much for having me. Uh, it's very, very enjoyable, and I wish you all great luck in your future endeavors, whatever they, whatever they may be. Thanks, Frankie. Thank you so much, Chris, and thank you to Food Banks Canada for all the work that they are doing. Uh, we are very close to announcing the results, but one more thing before that. We'd like to present uh, Food Banks Canada with a check from FDT Academy, um, and then from another organization that we work very closely, we have a student who's going to present as well. So first from us, 188 submissions times $5 a submission. Round it up. Uh, FDT Academy would like to donate. I don't know if they can see that, but... $1,000. Wow, thank you. Canada. That's great, Frankie. Thank you very much. <laughs> and um, I am, uh, my, we are still practicing social distancing here at FDT, but Kathy China is my mother, so we are in the same bubble for yes, those who are wondering. Yes, yes, um, yes. Uh, you know, we were given a note to just make sure that we're still promoting quarantine and social distancing by one of my uh, very bright colleagues, Jacqueline. So, uh, yes, we are still practicing social distancing here at FDT. Um, I'd now like to turn it over to Yuri Song, a grade nine student from the York House School, who is a representative of the Read, Speak, Learn organization, who uh, also would like to present um, a check to Food Banks Canada. Hello everyone, I am Miri Song from Read, Speak and Lead organization, and I'm here on behalf of our organization's management team, Grace Lee, Calvin Zhang, Kelly Chiu, Richard Chen, and all our teachers to present our check to the food bank. RSL is a nonprofit organization that was founded five years ago, and it consists of young teachers from grades seven and above from all around the world. We teach kids public speaking in one-on-one -on -one classes. This year, due to COVID-19, RSL initiated an online teaching method, and so far our 38 teachers have been teaching 51 students from Fujian and Guangdong, China, through WeChat and Zoom calls. We have collected $5,300 and would love to give back to our community here in Canada. We think the food bank is the perfect place for us to do donate the money to. Due to COVID-19, hundreds of thousands of people have lost their jobs and some rely on the food bank as a means of survival. We will continue our online teaching program and give back to our community to make it a better place for all of us to be a part of. Thank you so much, Yuri. Thank you, Yuri, very much. Thank you very much. That's great.
Another $5,000 to Food Banks Canada, thanks to Read, Speak, Le uh, Learn. Uh, my family and my staff have had the pleasure of going to China for the in-person teaching of, of Read, Speak, Learn. Um, and it was an amazing opportunity. I've been twice, my mom has been twice, um, and, and many of our teachers have gone with them as well to uh, help uh, spread speech and debate across the world, which really is the final mission of this competition and, and of uh, Fostering Debate Talent Academy, which is to get public speaking out to all students as it is, as it is truly the most valuable um, life skill, one that has helped me, uh, one that has helped all of our judges, whether they be in uh, a, a publicist, a CEO, a Miss World, or a world speech champion. Uh, public speaking is definitely the most valuable tool a person can have. And with that said, um, I will now be going to the results. And sorry, Read, Speak, Lead is the organization name. Um, apologies for, for the, the misname there. Thank you, Yuri. Okay. <laughs> so it's time for the results. Uh, students, you will be mailed your scholarship checks very shortly. And here we go. In the grade four to seven category, oh, last thing, the judges did not agree. They were not unanimous, which is a sign of a good public speaking competition. Um, and actually every single student was deemed first by at least one of the judges. So it just goes to show that on any night, any panel of judges, it can be a different person. But tonight, there can only be one winner in each category. In third place, receiving a $500 scholarship in the junior category, Jin Zhou. In second place, receiving a $1,000 scholarship in the junior category, Millie Steinman. Thank you, Millie. And our grade four to seven champion from Ontario receiving a $2,000 cash scholarship, it's Pratika. <laughs> Great to hear the cheering fans, Pratika. Congratulations. <laughs> okay, we're going to move on to the senior category, the grade eight to 12s. In third place, receiving a $1,000 cash scholarship from British Columbia, Rafiq. In second place, receiving a $2,000 cash scholarship from British Columbia, Ashley Wong. And the grade eight to 12 champion of the FDT Canadian public speaking contest, receiving a $3,000 cash scholarship it is from Alberta, Zaki Lakani. Thank you once again to our VIP judges. Thank you to all the students who entered. Thank you to the operations team at FDT Academy, Giselle Habib, Tanya Chenna, Kathy Chenna, and Jacqueline Belsberg for all of your hard work. And um, that's all from me. If you are interested to learn more about FDT Academy, go to fdtacademy.com. I'm Frankie Chenna. Thank you so much and good night. Hey, everybody.